So what I'm going to do this afternoon is to talk about the impact of power semiconductor technology, which is what I work on, on creating a sustainable society. So I promise you that it will not contain a lot of device physics, but more of the impact of this technology on all of you and every person on Earth, actually. So what I'd like to do is to begin by discussing what I mean by sustainable society. And I like to attribute this to a high standard of living, which we all aspire for. And that is representative of developed countries like the United States, uh, Australia, perhaps Canada. And in these countries, we are used to having a great deal of comfort like air conditioning systems, refrigeration, conveniences like everybody has a car for getting around and so on. But all of this leads to a very high level of energy consumption. Whenever you use your appliances, refrigeration systems, etc., you will have a lot of energy consumption. And that produces what we call a large carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon dioxide emitted per capita. So if you look at developed countries like the ones I spoke about, it works out to be about 20 tons per year for every person in the developed world. At the same time, we have the so-called underdeveloped nations like India, Brazil, China, which are all now called emerging nations, right? They're all moving fast towards prosperity. And all the citizens in those nations want to aspire towards a high standard of living like those in developed countries. So the carbon footprint for these countries is at the present time only about two tons per year. Consequently, the worldwide average carbon footprint happens to be about four tons or 8,000 pounds per year. But if all these people start aspiring for all these conveniences, you can definitely expect things to change. And in fact, if you look at the population distribution, it becomes very apparent that things are going to change. The population in these emerging countries is far greater, as noted here, compared to the developed countries. So what we need is some way of mitigating this effect. In other words, we need a way to improve the standard of living, because we cannot tell people in emerging nations not to have high standard of living. But we need to find a way for them to have a high standard of living without creating a large carbon footprint. Now we can do this by my telling you to go home and turn off all your lights, right? Stop using electric bulbs and start reading in candlelight. But that'll be like going back to the 17th century, and I don't think that'll be very popular. I could tell you to walk to work. I don't think that'll be very popular these days. Even I live way too far from where I work to be able to walk. I could tell you to hand your, hang your laundry outside, but with all the pollen hanging out in Raleigh today, right? <laughs> I'm not sure you want to do that. So what I'm going to say is I leave that to environmental activists. And I found a very interesting person named Ruslana. I don't know how many of you may have heard of her, probably not very many. But I heard about her on NPR. And she turns out to be Ukraine's biggest pop star. And what I found intriguing is that her album is called Wild Energy. And she, according to her publicist, she talks about the energy of the sun, the energy of wind, the energy of water, renewable energy, and energy independence, which is very much in sync with my talk. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, this is what NPR says. It says Ruslana doesn't actually sing about carbon footprints and gas prices. She actually sings about the wild energy of love. <laughs> and I'm sure you can all relate to that. So what I'm going to propose is, after this meeting, any faculty who want to join me in writing a proposal to NSF to explore the wild energy of love, <laughs> please see me. And I think this will be a very exciting project. And I think there's a lot of energy we could solve our whole global problem with energy. Anyway, turning now to the topic of my talk, which is how can we create the sustainable society by using technology, in particular electrical engineering technology and my own experience with power devices. So I picked out here four sectors of our economy, the consumer, industrial, lighting, and transportation sector. And in these sectors, for example, in consumer appliances or applications, what we're looking for is comfort and convenience. For example, you want washing machines, you want air conditioning systems run by heat pumps. In the industrial applications, we want robots for manufacturing. 
This increases the performance. You want all these to be very compact. To look at the density of those robots running uh, some kind of car assembly plant. In the case of lighting, we want good ambience and we want easy installation. What, what I mean by that is you want to be able to screw the lamp into your existing socket. You don't want to replace all your sockets in the process of adopting a new technology. And in the case of transportation, of course, we all want high mobility. You want to get there quickly and you don't want your car to break down, so it has to be reliable. But none of this is going to be possible unless we manage the cost. So every one of these applications is cost sensitive and all the performance attributes we want can only be acceptable to society if we keep the cost down. Now one way to keep the cost down is to have high efficiency. Turns out that if you develop electronics with high efficiency, you do get actually a lot of cost savings, not only from the electricity, but from the whole technology package itself. So what I'm going to talk about is innovation, but innovation that I'm particularly familiar with, which is power semiconductor devices, and how they have had an impact on not only these sectors, but many more. So to give you a big picture or a layman's view, perhaps, of what I'm talking about, let's look at what we do when we use our power sources. So if you have a power source like the AC power coming out of the socket, and then you want to turn on your light bulbs or a fan in your house, you use the mechanical switch on the wall, right? So that's shown over here. But you can do that perhaps once every second if you try really hard. Not that you want to, but I'm just making an example. On the other hand, I can develop an electronic switch like the IGBT that I'm going to talk about and perform the switching at a much, much higher rate, like 100,000 times per second. And by doing this, we have developed electronic technology that can shape the way we transfer energy from sources to loads. And by doing that, we have gained a huge amount in efficiency, and that's what I want to talk about. But in the process of transferring this energy from the source to the load, we do not want to lose any energy inside the power switch because that's all wasted energy. So we need highly efficient power semiconductor switches, and they are characterized by these features. So they have to have low on voltage, meaning when the switch is closed, we want no voltage across the device and no power dissipation. We want them to switch rapidly. As I said before, we want to use that to control the power flow, and we want it to do we want them to do that with very little power loss. But the other features are also very important. We want these devices to operate at high current density. The reason for this is that if I can make my chip current density large, I can serve an application with a smaller chip size, and that drives the cost down. So the IGBT innovation, in fact, improved the current density by like a factor of 10, giving huge benefits to improving our power conditioning. And then you want all this technology to be reliable and rugged. So to t tell you about the significance of the IGBT, I pulled out this chart, which was published in a magazine called Power Electronics Technology. And they did this in September 2005 when celebrating their 30th anniversary for publication of the magazine. And what they show is that in the history of device technology, the first significant event is attributed to the invention of the bipolar transistor by Bratton, Bardeen, and Shockley back in 1947, and they received the Nobel Prize in 1956. Subsequently, the idea of making integrated circuits was developed, and this was done in two places, at Texas Instruments as well as Fairchild, and Jack Kilby received the Nobel Prize in 2000 for his work in 1958. The work done at Fairchild by Noyce was not recognized because noise passed away before they gave the Nobel Prize. Now, if you look at the next big innovation, you find it is in power MOSFETs, but no individual is attributed to this because some of these ideas actually predate the work on the bipolar transistor. But they could not be implemented in reality because we did not understand what was going on on the surface of semiconductors, and you need to do that in order to make such devices. And it took a long time, about two decades, to work that out. The next important milestone is the one shown here with my name. And I used to complain that these guys got a Nobel Prize and where's my goodie, right? <laughs> but now I cannot complain anymore. The president was nice enough to give me the 2011 National Medal of Technology and Innovation. And some reporters have said that's like a Nobel Prize in engineering, so I'll take that. So this is a pretty important innovation in power electronics. 
and I want to tell you what it is. How does it, how did it come about? Why does it behave in such a superior way? So to do that, I have to take you back all the way to when the bipolar transistor was invented by Shockley, et cetera, at Bell Labs. But the goal at Bell Labs was to use this in communication systems. You know, they were mainly focused on the telephone network at that time. Whereas there were many companies like GE, the one I worked for, like Dan mentioned, where there was interest in controlling power and loads like motors. So they began to develop bipolar transistors that look like this. This is a vertical implementation of the bipolar transistor and those of you who have had at least an undergraduate class in solid state physics and devices know that it has a collector and an emitter through which the main current flows and you use a, a base contact to control that current flow. So in a power transistor this is done with one of these high current electrodes at the bottom of the wafer, one on top in order to allow us to handle high current levels. But fundamentally it's a bipolar transistor where we control this current by using another current at the base. Now the prevailing wisdom, uh, which was developed over 20, 30 years of work, was that you have to use electrons for current transport because electrons have much higher mobility than holes. And therefore it is better to make what we call NPN transistors than PNP transistors for our power control. And the prevailing wisdom was to make the base as narrow as possible and control the charge in the base to get high gain. This is what I teach my students who are taking my power device class. And then we talk about all the trade-offs we have to do to support high voltage, which is done inside this drift region. And after you do all these trade-offs, it's found that the gain isn't that great. It's like 10. So people struggled in making power circuits using these devices because the control circuit was very cumbersome, very expensive, and hard to manufacture. So some years later, once the MOS process was developed, Several companies that I mentioned before, Siliconics, International Rectifier, came out with power MOSFETs. These devices look a lot like the bipolar transistor, but the current flow actually occurs at the surface under control by this gate electrode. And only electrons are involved in current transport in this device. This device uh, involves the injection of electrons with some holes coming from the base, so that's called a bipolar device. And this is a unipolar device, so they're distinct families. And this set of devices started getting some market traction as well. Unfortunately, they found that when they tried to scale up this device to work at high power levels as required to run air conditioners or uh, any kind of higher power load, it lost its performance because the resistance in the device became extremely large and its on losses became too cumbersome. So the situation in the industry around 1980 can be expressed using this couplet from Rudyard Kipling. And some of you may have seen it. It says, east is east and west is west, never the twain shall meet. This is something we all hear in India because it's very pertinent to how the British came to India and how the two cultures did not match. Well, what, so what I'm saying here is there were two cultures. The culture of the bipolar transistor with companies like GE and Westinghouse with their own manufacturing practices and end customers and another culture consisting of the power MOSFET group, Siliconics, International Rectifier, with their own manufacturing practices and end customers. And the belief was that these are two fundamentally incompatible with each other. Well, I thought differently, so I came up with this innovation, which is now known as the IGBT. And in this device, I control the bipolar current flow within this structure by using an MOS gate structure. So it contains a hybrid of what's happening in the MOSFET as well as what's going on in the bipolar transistor. Now you might think that this would have immediately been accepted, but no, that's not how it works in this, in this community. So I'd like to give you another quote. This is from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, have you heard of the uh, 2001 Space Odyssey? He's the author of that and many other things. But one of the innovations that he proposed is geosynchronous satellites. So he's well known for not only science fiction, but actual uh, things that have been implemented by the world. So what he said is if you have a new idea, it invokes three reactions. The first reaction is it's completely impossible. It's not going to work. So that happened with me. They said, oh, this is not going to work. This is now a four-layer device. And we have been building four-layer devices for 30 years. And they latch up and your device will destroy itself. It's just not going to work. So I worked on proving that 
they were wrong. I knew I had to prove that before this device would be functional, so I, I knew I could make that happen. Then they said, well, okay, you say it's possible, but it's just not worth doing. Either we'll make these things better, or you will have a problem that you cannot control the switching speed of the device because all the known switching speed control processes were only applicable to bipolar devices. There was no process that had been developed for MOS devices. So I had to overcome that challenge, and I found a way to control the switching speed of this device over a very broad range, which is what has made it extremely useful in many, many applications. Well, once I proved all that, then the same people said, oh, I said it was a good idea after all. <laughs> so I said, okay, now I won them over. And some of them even claim to have invented it. That's not so good. So what does the IGBT do? It, it combines the best properties of bipolar transistors and MOSFETs. It has low on voltage drop, which is what I talked about before, high switching speed, high on state current density, very good ruggedness. But what I also discovered is that it can work at high temperatures. And that opened up a whole new class of applications like the CFLs that I'll talk about. And then the other great innovation I did is to make it highly manufacturable. So if you look at the structure, you'll notice that the upper part looks a lot like the MOSFET, if not identical in this picture. I took advantage of that. So what happens in industry if you go to work for a company in a research facility is that if you come up with an idea, you have to first prove that it works before they will take the risk of putting it into a manufacturing facility because it's a lot of cost to migrate a technology into manufacturing. And it takes several years to set up the manufacturing process in a research facility, work out all the bugs, make the device, prove that it works. And then you have the onus of transferring all that technology to the manufacturing people. So then you have to sit down with them and ask them, what new equipment do they need in the manufacturing line? How do they have to set up this new line to make this new product? And that gets very expensive. So that stage in the process of tech transfer is about 10 times more than the R&D phase. I mean, a lot of you may not realize that. So it's very difficult to take an innovation and move it from an idea all the way into a product. In my case, fortunately, because this upper structure was the same as the MOSFET, I convinced the GE management to let me take my idea and build it in a manufacturing line without doing any development in the research lab. That was kind of an unheard of practice, but I had the blessing of the chairman of the company because of its big impact inside GE, and as a consequence, I got the concept to a product in six months. And once I did that, we had huge numbers of devices coming out of the manufacturing line, all with very uniform characteristics, some things that we could adjust very easily for various applications. And this allowed me to proliferate the entire GE company with this new product. And they, they have very, very bright engineers everywhere. So in the uh, small appliance division, they started using it in steam irons and toaster ovens. In the major appliance division, they started using it in refrigerators, washing machines. In the lighting division, they started developing lamps with this. In the drives division, they started using it for motor control and blah, blah, blah. It just ran away. Okay, and that's the exciting thing that you want to see happen with any of your innovations, right? Good acceptance by the whole community, and this was indeed true at GE. All right, so what I'm going to do now is to take three examples and talk about the impact of the IGBT on your lives and on society. And I think these are really good examples because we can quantify the impact using known reliable information. So the first is the use of the IGBT to create the electronic ignition system that you all use in your automobiles. So next time you turn on your car, just remember Balaga because he made <laughs> the IGBT and the electronic ignition system. Next time you feel comfortable in your house with air conditioning, Remember me I'll again, <laughs> use the IGBT to make adjustable speed drives. Hopefully you've all been replacing your incandescent lamps with CFLs. If you have, then remember me. If you haven't, please replace them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's talk about the first case, which is the electronic ignition system. Well, you know that the internal combustion engine uses gasoline, and the gasoline has to explode inside the cylinder, basically, to drive the car. And that explosion is triggered by using the spark plug. So you compress the gasoline, mix it with some 
uh, air, and then you get the right composition and you, you explode that mixture. Now, if you look at the consumption of gasoline, uh, you find that two-thirds, or uh, I should say more than two-thirds, three-quarters, 76% is used by automobiles and trucks. So if you can reduce the fuel consumption by improving the use of gasoline, you get huge savings. So how is this spark plug system working? Well, for nearly 100 years, the internal combustion engine was run by the Kettering ignition system shown here, which contains a mechanical distributor. A lot of you are young, but some of you are older like me. And in the 70s, I remember going under the hood of the car and doing the tuning of my car with a strobe. Anyone remember that? Yeah, some of you do, okay. So that was to tune the distributor. With the availability of the IGBT, it became possible to run the spark plug using the IGBT as shown. So here the IGBT is used to interrupt the current in a coil, and those of you who have done fundamental electrical engineering, you, you know that if you try to do that, the voltage across the coil will go up very, very fast, and that is used to generate a big voltage that is then used to control the spark plug or discharge the spark plug. Now the advantage of using an electronic circuit is that it is much more precisely controllable. And it is also more reliable, meaning it does not drift with time, does not change. So you don't have to keep doing this tuning that we were talking about because these mechanical systems wear out and change with time. Of course, one of the advantages of having more precision was that a leaner fuel mixture could be used in the gasoline powered cars. And that has produced a improvement in fuel efficiency by at least 10%. There are lots of quantitative analyses done in many places that demonstrate this. So if you take all the gasoline that's consumed in the world over time, and I'm only going to go from 1990 onwards because this is when the electronic ignition system became widely adopted, then you find that huge amounts of gasoline have been saved in the United States as well as in the world, and this is coming from the uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, the US administration. And if you add these up, this is per year. So if you add all of these up, you get a cumulative gasoline savings of over one trillion gallons. That's an impressive number. I hope you're impressed. I was impressed when I found this. And because of this, there have been billions of IGBTs produced and sold to serve this market. One example is this ignition IGBT made by Fairchild Semiconductor, but there are about half a dozen companies that provide these kinds of chips. How about cost savings, which might be more interesting to you? It comes out of your pocketbook. So here's, for this, of course, you need the price of gasoline to figure out how much money you may have served, saved. So this shows the price of gasoline over time. Uh, in the 90s, the price stayed between one and one and a half dollars, and then, of course, you know how it's gone up and it's spiked uh, a few years ago, and now, of course, we're back up here, right? So we're paying close to $4 a gallon. And if you look at what's happening in the rest of the world, and those of you who travel to Europe, and I go to India sometimes, the price of gasoline is about three and a half times what we pay in the United States. So if you use the cost of gasoline at the pump, you find that you, the worldwide consumers have saved more than $5 trillion because you've saved $1 trillion of gasoline consumption. All right, now if you save gasoline consumption, then you also reduce carbon dioxide emissions as well as the emission of other noxious gases, not just carbon dioxide. But there's a lot of talk about carbon dioxide these days from the global warming perspective, so it's interesting to calculate those numbers. So for every gallon of gasoline that you consume, you will produce 19.4 pounds of carbon dioxide out of the tailpipe. So if you look at, and that's what it looks like, I guess. <laughs> so if you take all the carbon dioxide emission reduction due to the reduced gasoline consumption, it adds up to a huge amount, 22 trillion pounds. Something worth getting excited about. Well, next, I'd like to talk about adjustable speed drives. Now, adjustable speed drives are used to run motors. And it turns out that motors consume two-thirds of all the electricity that we use, not only in the world, in the US, but around the world. 
That's because motors are so prevalent, right? They're in your air conditioning systems, refrigeration systems, and so on. So this DOE report points out that for the case of residential applications, it's used mostly in refrigerators, freezers, and what they call space conditioning, which is air conditioning, heating. A very similar picture emerges for the commercial sector, except that these are big air conditioners used in buildings. And of course, there are lots and lots of vending machines that we all use. I heard uh, soda pop go off yeah, for soda <laughs> dispensing. So how can we improve the efficiency by which we run these motors? Well, to understand that, you have to know how it was done before the development of adjustable speed drives. So the process by which it was done is to take a fixed frequency AC source, which is what we get out of the socket, right? That's what the power company delivers to us. That's 60 hertz. And we feed it into an induction motor. Now, induction motors are very inexpensive to make and very highly efficient, 95% efficiency. And you can use that to run loads, and it works really quite well. The problem is that if you want to adjust the output of the load, like a fan or a pump, then you have to regulate it, and that was being done by using dampers. And dampers convert power into heat. So you're wasting all that energy that's being developed on this side, and the efficiency drops well below 50% when you do this. So it's a very inefficient way of controlling loads. So the adjustable speed drive was developed to overcome this limitation. The basic idea was to take the fixed frequency input, 60 hertz, convert it into DC, which is not shown here, and then to use IGBTs to create a variable frequency output power that you could feed to the induction motor. So using this approach, we can feed AC frequencies anywhere from below 60 hertz all the way up to about 10 kilohertz. Big range of frequencies. And you can change the rate at which this motor is turning. The motor, of course, is very happy to receive that power and still runs at 95% efficiency. And now we don't have the dampers, so we end up with very good efficiency, more than 90%. So you can see that this difference is very significant now in terms of efficiency. So one of the big attempts to develop these systems was undertaken by us at GE in 1983. In fact, the first IGBTs I made are shown in this uh, block. It's a tiny thing. I didn't bring, but it has an IGBT and a driver chip. And by using this, we were able to develop the first commercial adjustable speed drives. And G had a very successful business selling this to train and carrier. So if you go outside your house, it's usually a train or a carrier, right? OK, so what is the energy savings? Here's a study done by Eaton Corporation. And they've done this for a centrifugal fan, which looks like this. And what you find is that if you're running this full throttle, you don't get any efficiency gains by going to adjustable speed drive. So it works quite well. But as soon as you try to regulate it and back off, then you consume much more energy with the damper than you do with the adjustable speed drive. Now, I'm saying that this improvement is about 40%. But there are examples you can find with much, much greater savings. For example, Mayflower Vehicle Systems that makes the car body parts for Aston Martin cars says that they are getting a reduction in energy use by 88% by using ABB adjustable speed drives. That's huge. So it's much more than 40%. All right, if adjustable speed drives are so good and started getting widely adapted, of course the semiconductor industry started manufacturing and selling devices for it. So this shows a whole variety of IGBTs and different types of packages to serve different power levels. And now there are a dozen IGBT manufacturers around the world. GE, by the way, exited the semiconductor business and doesn't make IGBTs anymore, even though it was developed there. So in the US, we have companies like On Semiconductor, Fairchild, International Rectifier. In Europe, companies, well-known names, ABB, Siemens, Infineon, Philips. In Asia, a lot of Japanese companies, Fuji Electric, Hitachi, Mitsubishi, Toshiba, et cetera. So this use of adjustable speed drives has produced a 40% improvement in efficiency. And if 2 thirds of the electricity is used for this running motors, you can obviously see we get a huge energy savings from it. But to quantify this, we need to know how much electricity is consumed. 
So this graph shows the consumption of, of production of electricity from all the sources. And as I said before, two thirds of all this production is used to run motors. And notice that most of this production is coming from fossil fuels. Some of it is coming from nuclear, some from uh, hydro, and a very tiny fraction up here from, hydro, uh, from renewables. So if you take the energy savings that we can calculate from the use of this electricity, we find that in the world, uh, in the United States, we have saved between 100 gigawatts and 130 gigawatts over the years. A gigawatt is a big number, I hope, for you. Just as an example, one coal-fired plant produces one gigawatt of electricity. Okay. So if you don't need to build all these power plants, guess what? The utilities save a lot of money as well. So the utilities have saved $380 billion in power plant investments. Now, of course, you may not care what's happening at the utility side. You may care more about what's happening to your wallet, right? So what about consumers? Well, for consumers, you need to know the cost of electricity. And it turns out that the average cost of electricity in the US is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. It varies depending on state to state. So if you use the energy savings I just gave you and calculate the cost savings to consumers, you find it ranges from $80 billion to about $110 billion. And if you add that up, this is per year, if you add that up over 20 years, you end up with about $2 trillion saved by US consumers. You can repeat this analysis for the whole world. And as I said before, two thirds of the electricity is used to run motors in the world. And of course, we still get the 40% savings. But there is one thing you have to worry about, the adoption rate of adjustable speed drives, or what I call penetration rate. So in the US, there has been very strong use of adjustable speed drives because we have a very educated customer. In the case of Europe, it is very widely adopted because they're very concerned about energy efficiency. In Japan, it's, it's very widely adopted. But in many other countries, it is not as good. So I did a computation here of the penetration rate depending upon different, uh, different percentages. And I took into account the fact that worldwide electricity consumption is about five times what is consumed by the United States. So for a small population, we're still using 20% of the world's energy, but, but the rest of the world is consuming 80%. All right, so what I found is that the best estimate of adjustable speed drive penetration is about 50%. So that's the number I'm going to use. And if you use that, we find that worldwide utilities have saved about $890 billion. And if you apply this now to consumers like yourselves, then you find that worldwide consumers with 50% penetration rate, they have saved over $8 trillion. So that's pretty cool. Now, of course, I had to use the cost of electricity in the world, and that turns out to be about 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, what about the benefits to carbon dioxide reduction from not using so much electricity? Well, as I said before, Electricity is produced from various sources. Some produce carbon dioxide, others don't. Nuclear obviously doesn't produce any carbon dioxide, but most of the fossil fuel, or all the fossil fuel systems do produce a lot of carbon dioxide. So you have to look at the distribution of power production. And in the United States, this is the distribution we see with about 70% coming from fossil fuels, of which about 48%, I believe, is coal. Now coal, burning coal to produce electricity produces about two pounds of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. But natural gas and other sources produce a little less. So if you average this out, you find the average carbon dioxide emissions in the US are about 1.35 pounds per kilowatt hour. So from the energy savings I gave you in the previous chart and this number, we can calculate the carbon dioxide emission reduction and it works out between one trillion and about one and a half trillion per year. Uh, an accumulative value of about 27.9 trillion pounds. We can repeat this process for the world's consumption. In this case, you have to look at the distribution of energy sources in the world. And it turns out that it's not that different than for the United States, but the proportion for coal is a little less. Only 40% of the electricity is generated using coal in the world. So that reduces the amount of carbon emissions, and it works out to be 1.1 pounds per kilowatt hour. 
So using this 50% penetration rate, you can figure out that in the world we have reduced carbon emissions by 46 trillion pounds. These are all really big numbers. That's because of the volume of the application. Okay, next turning to the lighting sector. I want to point out that we have been using incandescent bulbs for a very long time. It, it's a relic of the Edison era. So we all know how famous Edison is holding up the light bulb. So I have a picture of mine holding up a light bulb as well. So how does this work? This works by heating a filament inside the bulb to 3,000 degrees centigrade, at which point we get some light. But most of the energy is used for heating the bulb. So less than 5% is actually converted into, elect into light. However, it's very inexpensive because of the work that's been done in the past and the simplicity of the structure. It's d considered disposable, although I'd be very careful with the glass. And it has, unfortunately, not a great lifespan. I don't know about you, but I get very annoyed because my incandescent bulbs keep burning out and I have to change them. So we needed something better. And at GE, we started working on this in the 1980s, and they found the IGBT was a great enabler. And these t projects were called Triad and Halark. There's, these are all uh, project names that we had for these types of lamps. And our goal was to create an electronic ballast that must fit in the base of the lamp. So the idea was to replace this lamp in its original socket, not to change the socket. Just keep the same screw in profile which means there's very little space in which all this electronics has to go. And that electronics is close to where the lamp is producing the light. And it is also, it's not 100% efficient, so it's also producing heat. So the electronics gets hot and nothing would work. Finally, we came up with the IGBT and as I said a little while ago, I showed that it works well at high temperatures, so they took advantage of that and built an electronic ballast that fit inside this footprint. And they thought they would be highly successful. And I thought they would be highly successful. Well, the lighting division did some studies with consumers. And they said, if we have to make money on this bulb, we have to charge $5 a piece. Now, remember, I'm talking about 1986 or so, OK, at that time frame. Well, you could go to a market, a supermarket, and buy this bulb for 50 cents or less. So they found that consumers would not even look at the $5 bulb. They would walk home with the 50 cent bulb. Now on the package, they try to put things like, over the life of the bulb, you're going to save money and blah, blah, blah. Nobody would read it. So they said, this is not a product we can sell. And it took a long time from, from that moment to actually get accepted. And it went more commercial outside the United States. But by 1990, it started getting very heavily commercialized. and what was taken advantage of is the fact that these CFLs reduce energy consumption by 75%. In addition, they have a long lifespan of 10,000 hours compared to incandescent lamps. And you have to also make note that lighting consumes one-fifth of the electricity used in the United States and the world. So remember, two-thirds goes to motors. Of the remainder, lighting is a big part. So you can save a lot of energy by improving lighting. So this shows the adoption of CFLs in the United States. And this shows that it has increased from next to nothing back in 99 to about 1 billion CFLs that are in use, which is, doesn't look too bad, right? However, <clears throat> I'll show you that around the world it is much, much bigger. So what is the energy savings we can get from these 1 billion CFLs that are in use? So this calculates the amount of electricity saved by assuming that a CFL runs for about 6 hours per day and saves 45 watts out of a 60 watt bulb. So you can see that we have save energy savings reaching about 50 gigawatts. And if you don't have to provide 50 gigawatts of power, the utilities save a nice chunk of change. A billion here, a billion there, and means something, right? How about in terms of cost savings for consumers? Again, using 10 cents per kilowatt hour, this works out to be a savings of about $2 billion per year for consumers at around this time, and a cumulative savings of about $50 billion. But one of the interesting statistics is that we have been rather reluctant to change our CFLs. I've heard of 
consumers running out of supermarkets with big boxes of incandescent lamps because the government might mandate the use of CFLs. So the consumer in the US is a little resistant and it's taking a long time. That is not true for the rest of the world. The rest of the world has been adopting them at a much faster pace. Right now there are about 14 billion CFLs in use. And this was published by International CFL Harmonization Initiative. So if you look at what's going on in the world, Australia was one of the first countries to ban incandescent lamps. They've also been banned now in Europe. And the only next best alternative is the CFL. Now in the future, we certainly expect LEDs to play a big role. But LEDs are very expensive and they need a change of the socket. So it is taking much longer to get those adopted. By 1996, it's interesting to learn that 80% of households in Japan had already converted to CFLs and 50% in Germany. And by now, I'm sure it's very close to 100%. I found it intriguing that in India, they have a big project. They call it the Bharat Lamp Yojana project where they're going to replace 400 million incandescent bulbs with CFLs. So all of this is, of course, producing lots of power savings, as shown here. And if you don't have to, sorry, if you don't have to uh, generate this power, then you can save a lot of investment in power plants. Of course, this also produces huge amount of cost savings to consumers. Now, the average electricity cost in the world is a little higher than in the United States. So here's some statistics on cost of electricity at different places, particularly in Europe. You can see in Denmark, they pay 40 cents, 43 cents per kilowatt hour. Germany, it's 31 cents. Oh, Italy should be 37, not 0.37. <laughs> Let's not all quickly move to Italy now because it's cheap. In Russia, it's much less, 17. I think they probably subsidize electricity. In Finland, it's only seven cents because they have other sources like geothermal and so on in Finland. So the average I'm using is 20 cents per kilowatt hour based on the data available. And based on that, we can conclude that the cumulative electricity cost savings to consumers adds up to about $2 trillion. Of course, all of this electricity reduction reduces carbon emissions. And in the United States, if you add up all the carbon emission reductions, you get a chart like this with a total savings of $659 billion. And that's based on the same distribution of electricity generation as well as the average emission per kilowatt hour. If you do the same kind of analysis worldwide, you find that the carbon emission reduction is much greater and it amounts to $10 trillion, uh, 10 tr trillion pounds. And that's based on this distribution of power generation and an average emission of 1.1 pounds per kilowatt hour. All right, so I want to summarize this to give you a feel for what this technology has done just for these three sectors. So if you look at the electronic ignition system, as I said, we've saved 1 trillion gallons of gasoline. In the US, consumers have saved 570 billion dollars. In the world, five, over 5 trillion dollars. Adjustable speed drives, we've saved 20 terawatt hours of electricity generation. In the world, about 40 terawatt hours. And that adds up to very high, again, uh, savings for consumers as well as for the utilities. And the same is true for compact fluorescent lamps, where we've saved about 500 terawatt hours and nine terawatt hours around the world. So that also adds up to a lot of money. So if you add up all this, you get the number that I think Dan mentioned in his introduction. The overall cost savings to consumers in the world amounts to over $15 trillion. I wish I had a few of those trillion in my pocket. <laughs> no. OK, so another way to look at this, which you might find interesting, is that we have not had to construct over 900 coal-fired power plants. And if you look at this from a hydroelectric point of view, it is like not building 600 hydroelectric dams. And you know hydroelectric dams have a huge environmental impact as well. In fact, there is a lot of tension between China, pa Pakistan, and India about water supply and dams being built in the Himalayas because of this. So it could even lead to a war someday. In terms of uh, carbon emissions, we find the electronic ignition system has had these huge impacts on reducing carbon emissions. Same is true for adjustable speed drives and compact fluorescent lamps. If you add these up, you get a total carbon emission reduction of 
more than 78 trillion pounds. And to give you a perspective on this, if you look at the average human footprint, which is 8,000 pounds per person that I talked about at the start, and we assume we have about 6 billion people, then we are producing 48 trillion pounds of emissions. So this reduction is equivalent to what is produced by the whole global population in about 1.6 years. Of course, this savings came over a period of 20 years. All right, so I've talked about three sectors, but I don't want you to go home thinking, ah, that's all it's used for. It's used to enrich your lives in so many more ways. So let me quickly try to show you those. So here's an example of a washing machine drive. So next time you clean your clothes, remember that the IGBTs are doing it for you. Here's an induction cooktop. Most homes now have these nice, clean, flat surface cooktops, right? You can even get a portable one to put on your, on your table, and this shows the circuit used to do it with IGBTs. Here's an example of a food processor. Hope I'm making you hungry. <laughs> Here's how about keeping your house clean? All the vacuum cleaners now are using IGBTs to run switch reluctant motors because these switch reluctance motors can increase the speed and improve the cleaning process, the suction. They're used even in your microwave oven. It's interesting to find that by using IGBTs in a resonant circuit, they were able to reduce the weight of the transformer by a factor of 10 times, making the microwave much easier to move around. I, I didn't know that until I found this interesting paper. How about in your cameras and your cell phones? Some of my phone, I don't think, yeah, my phone has a flash. So all these flashes use xenon bulbs, but these xenon bulbs need a pretty high voltage to discharge. And surprisingly, they need a lot of current for a very short time. And only the IGBT has that compact footprint to handle such a high voltage and high current, even though it's a small power level. So this is another application. I remember going to Japan, oh, maybe 15 years ago, and somebody took my picture and said, Professor, your invention took your picture. I said, wow, that's cool. <laughs> Plasma TVs, not something that I realized had IGBTs till I started looking into it. So all the... Uh, Sustain and refresh circuits in plasma TVs are using IGBTs, and many IGBTs, in fact, and this is saving power by about 20%. In the transportation sector, IGBTs have taken a role in all levels of transportation now. It started at lower power levels, but now even bullet trains, these Shinkansen, TGV, high-speed trail, all use IGBTs. This is an interesting quote from Alstom. They claim to be the leaders in using IGBT-based drives for traction. And they say that Onyx traction system using IGBTs have reduced the volume 50%, reduced weight 30%, reduced life cycle cost by 33%, improved reliability by 50%. In China, they're going gangbusters on high-speed rail. In the last IEEE Spectrum, recent one I read, they're spending $500 billion on high-speed rail, and it's all being done by using these kinds of drives. Even in India, I've read articles that they're saving lots, amount, lots of energy by using these new drives. In the United States, we are a little bit behind on high-speed rail, right? So we'll get there someday. But we are using it in places like airports and urban transit, like, for example, this one in Vancouver. But one place where we are finding a great deal of use of IGBTs is in elect hybrid electric cars. So here's the Toyota Prius and the IGBT module that's used inside. There are various modes in which the car runs. Sometimes it runs off the battery. Sometimes you have to charge the battery uh, th through the uh, internal combustion engine. Sometimes you use regenerative braking and so on. But in all of these modes, of course, the internal combustion gen engine uses IGBTs for the spark plug. And then for running the electric motors, it's all done with IGBT-based adjustable speed drives. If you buy a car that's not a hybrid, like a Tesla Roadster, I'm sure many of you have that, right? <laughs> I think you have to queue up behind George Clooney to get one of those. Or you can buy the GM Volt. Then you need a charging station. So all these charging stations also use IGBTs. Now, one of the areas where I was personally involved is, of course, at GE in the industrial sector. And this is a plaque that I received 
for developing what's called the Genius I.O. product for numerical controls. For this product, I had to develop not only the N-channel IGBT that I showed you, but also a P-channel complementary device. And that allowed us to release this product and obtain the order for the first Saturn assembly plant. And GE went from nothing to a big player in the automation business. And now it's very widely used for controlling robots. Many other applications like steel mills, textile mills, induction dryers, arc welders, milling machines, drilling, oh, they all use IGBT-based drives. In fact, I was surprised to get an invitation from a steel conference in India saying, we're using so many IGBTs, could you come and give a talk? I said, wow, that's gonna be weird, sitting in front of people making steel. Medical sector, lots of applications that GE, when I was still there, it was used to create the drive for the gantry. This is what positions the patient, and you have to, of course, do that accurately to get the scan. It also positions the X-ray tube and the detectors. Same is true for the MRI scanner. It is used in the power supply for X-ray machines. It is used to drive the transducers in ultrasound machines. And although this is not a medical application, I threw this in here because it's related to X-rays. All your baggage scanners are using IGBT-based power supplies. But my favorite application in the medical sector is, of course, the defibrillator. And this is an interesting application because it's saving large amounts of lives. By having a defibrillator available at airports, buildings, you can react to someone having, I guess I'm calling it cardiac arrest, I hope that's the right term, and you can give them a jolt and save their lives. But you have to react within 10 minutes to have good success in reviving a person. So having these in the proximity of the victim is really important. That's why they're even flying them on planes. And what I read in the IEEE spectrum is that the only way they could do it is with IGBTs. This is the reference. And they use this to create a 100 kilowatt biphasic shock from a 2,000 volt source. And only IGBTs have the compact form factor to allow them to do that. And it's saving about 100,000 lives. It's pretty cool for an invention that I made for running motors, right? Okay, how about other applications? It's used in the aerospace sector. For example, the 787 Dreamliner is going from hydraulic controls to all electric. It's all done with IGBT-based actuators. Same is true for the Airbus. I was surprised to find it's running cruise ships. The so next time you take a cruise, as long as it doesn't crash, <laughs> like, like the Italian island, you, you can thank me for that. It is used for many other ships too. For example, there are ships called Roro ships. These are where you roll cars on, roll them off when you ship cars across the Pacific. It's used in the defense sector for the Bradley fighting vehicle. It's used in submarines. It's used in aircraft carriers. It is used even by the financial people, which su might surprise them. Well, what do you want in a financial sector? You want a very, very reliable source of electricity so that your data doesn't get compromised. And now you're doing uh, sales and transactions in milliseconds if you've heard about all the trading that's going on. So you want a very reliable power supply and uninterruptible power supplies are done by using IGBTs. In the agricultural sector, it's used for food processing and sterilization. It is used even in the fossil fuel sector. It is used actually to heat the pipes that go under the ground to pull out the oil. And by heating the pipes, the slurry or the oil gets a little warmer and it comes out more easily apparently. Okay, but for me the most exciting new application is going to be in the renewable energy sector and many of us are working on this and there are two primary sources here. There's wind power and there's plenty of wind power according to the Department of Energy. There's plenty of solar power as well. If you look at power stations, the electricity generated by solar cells is a DC voltage. Of course the power grid and the power that we need for our homes is AC power. So we have to have an inverter that converts the DC power from a solar panel into AC, and that's all done with IGBTs. So this is true for your rooftop as well as solar farms. If you look at wind, it's catching on in most parts of the world. We have wind farms in the US, lots of them in Europe. There's even a picture I found from my home state, not home state, I should call it where I went to the university, in Tamil Nadu in India. Now why do we need IGBTs in wind power? It turns out that wind, unfortunately, is not blowing at a constant speed. 
We all know that from personal experience. So the wind fluctuates, so the turbine is turning at different speeds, and that variable frequency cannot be fed into the grid. So we first convert it to DC and then use IGBTs to convert it uh, to the regulated 60 hertz AC. Now one of the big advantages of using IGBTs is that it is very compact and much lighter than other technologies, so it could be put on top of the tower. And that got rid of the gear train that they used to use, which was unreliable, very cumbersome, and very heavy. So they greatly improved the efficiency while reducing size and weight. But here's a very interesting quote from Electronic Design Magazine in 2004. It's actually stated that progress within IGBT technology has made the biggest single contribution to wind turbine advances over the past several decades. Very surprising to hear. All right, so I'm coming to the end of my talk, but I wanted to tell you that this is not the only innovation we can do. We can do more innovations in terms of power semiconductor technology. And what we are now working on is based on wide band gap semiconductors. And this is based on something I worked out in 1982, where I started looking at how can we replace silicon with something that may be better. And I derived this equation which said that wide band gap materials will be much better than silicon. So of course I thought people will call me a great philosopher for having discovered this, like Socrates. Instead, they said I was like Chicken Little. <laughs> what does that mean? That means I'm an alarmist, crying foul when there's no need to worry. We have many years of using silicon. Why do we need something else? Well, after 20 years, people have realized that silicon does run out of speed. And now this denominator of this equation is named after me. There are only three such named equations, so this is pretty cool. And in Japan, for example, I get called more respectfully sensei instead of chicken little. So what, what is the advantage of wide band gap materials? Well, gallium arsenide can give us an order of magnitude. What I showed is that silicon carbide can give us two orders of magnitude. This is actually what got me interested in coming to NC State in 1988, because we had a very strong program here in material science. And then Cree was spun off from NC State and gave us wafer supply. In 91, I founded a research center in which we started exploring this. Within a very short time, we produced the first high voltage silicon carbide power devices that proved that the theory was right. And some years later, we built a MOSFET as well. Now, once the proof of concept was there, lots of investment went into it in the United States, DOD. In uh, Europe, there's a spirit program. In Japan, METI put in lots of money. And now we have since 2000, we have many companies now manufacturing and selling silicon carbide devices. So this has been a major success and is considered the next big step in terms of power devices. At NC State, we are also researching gallium nitride. And our recent work has shown that we can get performance even better than silicon carbide. How does this matter? Well, one place where it matters is in your electric car. This is uh, Toyota's Prius roadmap, and it shows various generations of cars that they're producing. All of these cars use silicon IGBTs, as illustrated here. But for the higher power levels that they want to do, they're moving to silicon carbide and gallium nitride, because as this chart shows, you can get a 10x reduction in losses, and there, there are some other system level benefits as well. At our Freedom Center at NC State, we're working on these wide band gap semiconductors over here for use in the utility applications for making an intelligent grid. So that's another big application. So I want to conclude my talk because I think I've spoken for enough time. And I want to do that by going back to the first chart that I showed you. And I think my uh, talk has, has hopefully been convincing that IGBT is an enabling technology that allows us to live a high standard of living through its impact on all the things that we use every day. It is also a device that has produced big gains in efficiency and mitigated our energy consumption. And this is also going to keep our carbon footprint low, so I can still claim to be the man with the lowest carbon footprint in the world. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>